Welcome guys to our 10th session of the um, First Do No Harm Summit. Um, it has been an absolute cracking weekend and if you couldn't tell, um, my brain is slightly fried because I just about to call, I was just about to call it the Stronger Bond Workshop. Uh, that's just, um, <laughs> that's just because there's been so much information in the videos that not only have I been hosting it, I've been listening, I've been taking notes, I've been trying to learn stuff and really I should sit down and binge watch all of this tomorrow when I have my day off. Um, but hopefully you guys have been having a great time so far and those of you who have been um, watching live, thank you very, very much. Um, and again, a big thank you again to our previous um, presenters throughout the last couple of days. What um, we are presenting on, um, Christine from Equine Muscle Mass uh, Matters, who is um, an absolutely amazing body worker. Um, she actually works with um, my boy Custard and makes a huge difference to the point where he would um, drop everything and me in a heartbeat to go and see her because she's so, <laughs> um, because he likes um, her um, work on him so much. He feels so great afterwards. So. Um, she's absolutely amazing and she's got some really great um, information to share with you. Before I hand it over to Christine though, just a couple of quick notes. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please do pop them into the comments or the chat box. Um, we are very happy to read them out and answer them as we go. However, if we do um, skip forward a little bit further, we'll collate those missed questions and um, summarise them at the end of the session. Um, of course, if you can't stay for the entire session, we know that it, um, in Australia it's 5 p.m. So some of you are probably trying to feed horses or uh, get dinner ready or all those kinds of things. That's okay. The videos are going to be in our Facebook group so you can watch them on replay um, as long as you like. Just um, put the hashtag replay in front of it so that we know that you're catching up. And if you are preferring to um, watch via webinar, the link will be emailed out to you later tonight or early tomorrow morning. Um, so you can binge watch all of the sessions that we have had so far. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to hand over the reins to Christine. Welcome, Christine. Thank you. And thank you for that um, absolutely amazing introduction. I hope I live up to expectations. <laughs> you do. You already know you do. <laughs> Okay, so um, as you said, I'm going to talk a little bit about strengthening and suppling um, your horse. I think it's really important for horse owners to have some things that, that you can do with your own horses. So in between bodywork sessions or you know, if your horse is feeling a little bit stiff or you're away at a competition or whatever that may be, that you've actually got some, some tools that you can use to help your horse. So just a little bit about me, first of all. So I'm an equine body worker. Um, and within that, I have a range of different um, modalities that I use. So I've done the Equinology um, Body Worker qualification. I've done kinesiology taping, dry needling, photonic therapy, um, and lots of other things that um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so I first qualified as a body worker straight out of uni. So um, when I was 21, I think I took the course and probably qualified at 22. So been qualified for a long time. Um, but really, I, I suppose I've only been doing this as a full time job for about the last three and a half, four years. Um, and then I also have a range of other qualifications. So um, I've got a degree in equine science, and also a post grad certificate in equine science. Um, for years, I worked as a, a riding coach. So I do understand, you know, the difficulties that a lot of riders have with their horses and I suppose that's really what made me want to learn even more about the horse's body and helping the horse to cope with the, whatever riding it is that we want to do. Um, but on top of that I really believe that the rider has a big impact on the horse as well and so I'm studying a diploma of remedial massage and also um, a degree in osteopathy so that I can work with horses and riders in the future. So 
I'm just going to you know, get, get the formal bit out of the way. So this um, presentation is designed to give you some suggestions for strengthening and suppling your horse, but it isn't intended to replace qualified therapists or your vet. So some of the techniques that I'm going to give you, they're pretty much suitable for the majority of horses, but obviously if your horse does have any issues, you might need to consult your own therapist or, or vet. Um, and especially if when you're doing any of these exercises, your horse is struggling, then I would suggest that you get some advice. So just a few things for you to consider. So it's always important to remember what your goal is. So obviously different disciplines, different levels of competition or riding are going to have different requirements for your horse. And so that might impact the types of things that you're going to be doing with your horse. The age and condition of your horse is really important. So you know, your younger horses are going to be pretty flexible, but maybe not as strong. Your middle-aged horses, um, so you know, you're anything from eight through to 12, yeah, they're going to be pretty strong at providing they've been um, ridden correctly and they don't have any injuries. And then your older horses, again, they, they are going to start decreasing in suppleness and then also strength. So, you know, when I give exercises to owners to do after I've seen their horse, I take all of those things into consideration as well as what I'm actually seeing in the horse's body to make sure that the exercises that I'm providing are going to be the best exercises to improve the horse's body. Um, the horse's prior training um, also comes into effect. So not so much with the exercises that I'm going to give you today, but sometimes you know, the, some of the exercises that I give to owners, they may require a certain level of training or riding ability. Um, and obviously, depending on what your horse has been trained to do, is going to change the way that it is moving and using its body. Obviously, yeah, previous injuries will have a big impact on the horse's body, and we really need to take those into account. So, you know, if your horse is recovering from an injury, then we take things much slower. Um, and even if that injury has been a little while ago, it may still impact the horse, and the horse may compensate and use its body differently. And I guess that moves into the next point of is your horse moving correctly and I'm a really firm believer that what you do with your horse when you're riding has a big impact on the horse when you're not riding so yeah one of my biggest recommendations for anybody is to make sure that you get a good trainer who understands the horse understands how the horse moves understand um, how different exercises impact the horse and can help you to make sure that your horse is moving correctly. It's also important to remember that each horse is an individual, so not every horse is built the same. We know that they all have different conformations, so that may mean that they actually find some exercises much more difficult than others. So we need to adapt those exercises for the individual horse. It's really important when you're doing anything with your horse that we try and avoid fatigue as much as possible. And so, um, you know, if your horse starts to fatigue because it, you know, you're doing a lot of different exercises perhaps and it's not fit enough, then it actually increases the risk of that horse injuring itself. So my philosophy is to always try and get the horse to move correctly. And if they start to tire, then I either stop completely, just do my cool down, or I might move on to another exercise. And that could simply be because the horse hasn't been using certain muscles and they're finding that really difficult. It's a bit like if you go to the gym and you start doing lots of reps, at some point you're going to get tired. And when we get tired, we start to compensate and use our body differently. And that's when we actually risk injuring ourselves. Warming up and cooling down is super important. I'm not going to talk about that too much today, but um, please just make sure, you know, whenever you're riding, 
that you do have a good warm up and a good cool down. And rest days are also really important because your horse needs time off to allow its body to repair so that um, it doesn't become injured. And one of the biggest causes of injury in the horse is um, repetitive strain. So just by doing or using the same um, parts of the body over and over again, we get tiny bits of damage and that can build up until it gets to the point where the horse actually then gets a, an actual injury. So for example, in the tendon, um, you know, each time you ride the horse, there is going to be micro damage. But if we push the horse and don't allow that tendon time to recover, then at some point you're going to get a tendon injury. So why is strength and suppleness in the horse important? Um, now I've called it fitness and, fitness and conditioning here because really if we're strengthening and suppling the horse, we are conditioning the horse and we're increasing the fitness. Um, so obviously you know, if we've got poor fitness and conditioning, then we get reduced performance. So your horse isn't going to be performing at the level that you want it to be. And that may be that the horse is knocking jumps, it's shortening its stride, um, whatever that may be. Increased fatigue, so we've already talked about that a little bit. Increased risk of injury, pain, and then behavioral issues. And you know, probably not all, but a lot of behavioral issues are linked to pain in some way and so it is important that if you're getting behavioral issues you look at whether there is anything that could be causing pain first and if you've ruled everything out pain wise then you might start looking at, at training and other things um, that could be causing those issues but you know a, a lot of horses will start to bark or you know put their ears back, not want to canter, whatever it is, because of pain. And then um, on the other hand, you go know, good fitness and conditioning enhances performance, it improves muscle tone, increases flexibility and the gait and range of motion and reduces the risk of injury. So obviously you know, they're all things that we want from our horse and we want those really no matter what you're doing with your horse. So whether your trail riding, whether you're competing, whichever discipline it is, we're looking for all of those things to give us the best horse and to make sure that our horse can keep performing for as long as possible. So it's really important to remember that the whole body is connected and this picture shows some of the fascial chains within the horse. So you can see that even if something starts up by the head, so if we, for example, look at the green line, you know, it starts up around the pole, but it goes all the way through the back, down to the abdomen, and all the way down through the hindquarters. So, you know, pain in the hindquarter can cause an issue in the front of the horse and vice versa. So whatever we're doing with the horse, we need to remember that everything is connected and we can't just treat one area of the body and think about that as a separate entity. Um, and one saying that I, I really like is that, you know, most of us know that there's something like you know, 600 odd muscles in the horse's body, but a different way of thinking about it is that it's actually one muscle poured into 600 fascial pockets. So that really shows how the horse is completely connected. Um, and the fascia is, um, if, you, um, if you've ever sort of cut a, a piece of meat and you can see that sort of stringy white um, fibrous -y material in there, that's your fascia. Um, and that pretty much surrounds and is entwined and goes through every single muscle in the horse's body. So as I said, you know, it's just really important to remember that the entire body is connected in the horse. So 
I wanted to talk a little bit to start with about the surfaces that you're riding on. And riding on different types of surface can help to strengthen different structures of the horse. And so I really encourage everybody to ride um, on as many surfaces as you can. So try not to always just ride on a um, sand arena, you know, ride on grass, go out on a trail ride so that you're actually strengthening different structures of the horse. So your softer surfaces, so things like sand, they require more muscular effort and a greater range of motion of the joints. It is important to make sure that um, when you're riding on soft surfaces that they're not too deep because that can um, actually cause injury when the horse is having to put more effort into, for example, lifting its leg out of out of the sand if it's really deep. Um, whereas your firm surfaces stimulate bone adaptations and can increase bone density. So I know years ago, like you know, when I was first doing my qualifications um, through the British Horse Society, and so I would have been 15, I think. Um, and at that time, it was very common to be told that when you're fitting a horse, you do lots and lots of road work and do lots of trotting on the road to strengthen the horse's tendons, I think they said at that point. That's incorrect. Um, your you know, your um, firmer surfaces will strengthen the bone, but if you do too much work on those firm surfaces, then you are actually going to increase the concussive forces, and so you're going to increase the likelihood of getting um, you know, bony changes, arthritis and things like that. So it is a balance. Um, I do lots of walking on roads, but very little trotting um, because, you know, walking on, on roads is great because there's not that such a concussive force. When you start trotting, you increase how um, hard, I guess, the, the, the legs are hitting the ground. Um, uneven and undulating ground increases the horse's proprioceptive skills. So proprioception is essentially knowing where the part of the body is in space at any time. So, you know, if you only ever walk on very, very flat ground and you suddenly go onto a bit of rocky ground, you're going to really struggle and your body's going to not quite know where to put the foot and where, um, where the ground is actually going to hit your foot. And the same for the horse. So riding them on surfaces that aren't perfectly even is very good for increasing the horse's proprioceptive skills. In saying that, what we don't want is to be working on an uneven surface that goes from very soft to firm, so, you know, for example, in the arena, one end of the arena being really deep and the other end of the arena being really shallow and hard because your horse um, can't adapt to that quickly enough. Hill work is also really good for your horses, um, but there are times when, or certain injuries where hill work probably isn't the best to do. So you do need to be a little bit cautious with that um, if you've got a horse that's had an injury um, or hasn't been in work for a long time or is very unfit. Um, and in those cases, just do um, less hill work and so sort of, you know, your shallower hills rather than going up a really steep cliff. And working in water is really beneficial for the horse as well. Um, it increases, um, sorry, it decreases the concussive forces, but it has um, really great benefits for the body. And depending on how deep the water is, will affect how the horse uses its body. So when the water is shallower, the horse will lift its legs up higher. So it's using the, the muscles. So it's um, similar to the soft surface where it's increasing that muscular effort and increasing the range of motions of the joints. Whereas when it's then deeper, 
it can't lift the leg up so it's not working on the range of motion of the joints so you're not getting that stretching and movement there but you are getting the muscular effort of your horse having to push through the water and again with all of these um, if you've been riding on one surface primarily and you move on to a different surface, just bear in mind that it is going to be different for the horse. And so you may need to scale back the amount, um, the length or the intensity of the exercise to allow the horse to get used to the new way that it's having to use its body. Okay, so... I'm just going to talk through a few really simple exercises that you can do with your horse. These are all exercises, um, just thinking what I've put in there, I think they're all exercises that can be done either in hand or ridden, so entirely your preference. And the majority of these, I think, are all walk exercises. So they're suitable for any level of fitness of the horse. And um, so they're, they're pretty much all exercises that whatever level of training or whatever age or breed or everything else your horse is, these exercises should be suitable for them. So this pole exercise is really simple, but it's very good for... Um, the horse's proprioception again, and also for um, getting them to use their core muscles a little bit more. So essentially you walk towards a single pole on the ground and you'll have to forgive my drawing. Obviously this horse um, is very, um, it's definitely not to scale with the arena because otherwise it would be a giant. Um, but you've got um, one pole and you can have a few poles scattered around the arena rather than just using one single pole so you, you know at the end of this I've said go back to this pole but you could have another pole say at A um, and, you know a few scattered around the arena so you can walk through to those so walking to the pole you halt just before the pole and ideally we want the horse to be halting as square as possible because if they halt with one front leg in front of the other, then they're automatically going to start walking with the opposite front leg. So ideally we get them to halt as square as we can just before the pole. And you're then going to ask the horse to step over it. And we're gonna ask them to step over it with one leg first and then just keep walking. Do the exercise again. This time you're going to ask them to start with the other front leg. So the reason for doing this is to get the horse using both sides of its body evenly. So um, yeah, most of you probably know that horses um, have a tendency to, to want to use one side of their body more than the other, same as us. We're left or right-handed. Horses not quite to the same extent, but they definitely do have a dominant leg. And so this exercise just encourages the horse to use both legs evenly. Um, if you want to go one step further, um, what you can do is get the horse to step over with one leg and then halt, step over with the other front leg, halt, step over with the hind leg, halt, and then the final hind leg. So that's just taking it to sort of the, the next level um, and getting them to really control the movements throughout their body. Um, so yeah, so I say this is a, a really simple exercise, but it's a really beneficial one for the horse. And even if you just do this in your warm up, that would be really good for the horse um, to do. And as I said, yeah, you can do this one ridden or in hand. Um, slowing the walk is another really beneficial exercise. And I'm sorry, yeah, these aren't the fun things like doing lots of jumping or going really fast. This is all about going slow and really getting the horse to think about what their body is doing and using the body correctly. So the reason that I encourage people to do this exercise is that it again increases the horse's proprioception 
it increases their balance and also increases the correct use of the back muscles. And the, the way the horse is built, essentially its back muscles are probably the most important part of the horse for how it's going to move. So a lot of people would probably think that the hindquarters, you know, they're the powerhouse, that's where all of that power comes from. But the back connects everything else. So if the back isn't being used correctly, then whatever is happening in the front in, in the hind end isn't going to be transferred through to the front end of the horse. So it's really important that we work on increasing that use of, of the, those muscles of the back. So the aim of this exercise is to really get the horse walking as slowly as possible. Um, and I mean so slowly that it's literally taking one step and then the next step. So you know, you're almost at a halt, but not quite. And it's important that the horse is as straight as possible and walks in a straight line. So you know, we don't want the horse crooked, um, so overbending one way, because again, it's not going to be coordinating its muscles correctly. Um, and whether it can walk in a straight line or not will tell you how, how connected the horse's body is. And it's a little bit like if we are riding a bike, if you're going fast, it's really easy to stay in a straight line because momentum just keeps you straight. If you ride a bike really slowly, it's much harder and you wobble all over the place. Okay, and then that takes a lot more coordination from you to keep the bike straight. And it's the same for the horse. So, you know, the faster the horse is going, the easier it is for them to stay straight. Um, and they can do that without really having to coordinate the, the muscles through their back. Um, but if they're going really slowly, then it's much harder for them and they have to really coordinate their muscles and think about what they're doing with their body. So this can be quite difficult and it can be quite um, challenging for the horse. Um, so always do this for short periods of time to begin with and then gradually increase the length of the time and the number of repetitions within your session. And so the reason for that is uh, obviously it's hard for the horse to coordinate its back, but because it is challenging, they can get a little bit fussy while you're riding them and trying to do this. So if you can do it just for a really short period of time to begin with, slow it down and then you know go back to your normal walk and then try again a bit later, and then your horse will start to accept that a lot better. Um, and you can also do a sem very similar exercise in trot. So slowing the trot down as much as you can so your horse almost stops but just using enough seat and leg so you keep the horse trotting really slowly i'm not talking so much your collected trot um you know we we haven't quite got um you know we won't have the amount of upward movement in like your pf and passage but you're just slowing the speed down Okay, so backing up the horse is another really good exercise. And it's just um, getting the horse to move a little bit differently to how it usually does. So with this exercise, the horse will actually start to round or flex through its back a little bit and should tuck its pelvis underneath. So you know, a lot of horses would be often in an anterior tilt. So the pelvis is tilting forwards and the horse will hollow its back. And with the, this exercise, we're putting them more into a posterior tilt. So they're tucking their hindquarters underneath them. And yeah, that's not quite so important, but it's just getting the horse to use its back a bit differently um, and getting that movement through the back. So very similar to us, you know, if you only ever sat or stood in one position with your back in one position, then 
you would find it very difficult to do any other movements. So this exercise is just getting the horse to use its back a little bit differently and we're getting a bit more flexibility through the back with doing this. Again, always introducing this exercise very gradually. So asking just for a few steps initially. Straightness is really important with this exercise. <coughs> Excuse me. So you know, if your horse is um, sort of swinging its quarters out one way or the other, then this exercise isn't going to have the same effect. So there's a few things to look at if your horse is swinging its quarters one way or the other, or it may swing them both ways. And that's essentially to make life a little bit easier for them. Um, and yeah, I like to say that as a rider, we really should be our, our horses, um, PT, you know, with the instructor telling, telling the horse how to do something, if they're doing it correct and correcting them if they're not exactly like if you went to the gym and had a personal trainer, they look at how you're doing the exercises. You know, they don't necessarily just make you keep doing more and more, but they will correct you know, your form of how you're doing those so that you get the best, um, the best outcomes from doing those. So first of all, check yourself if your horse is crooked. So if, um, if a horse goes crooked while they're backing up, and I do this often when I'm assessing a horse, I'll always ask the handler to stand on the other side of the horse, first of all, just to see if that changes how the horse moves. Um, if it does, then it's the handler that is making the horse go crooked. If they still go crooked, um, it's really important to think about where you as a handler are looking. I find a lot of people tend to focus down on the horse's legs. So you know, you're actually looking at where the legs are going and um, you actually need to be looking up over the hindquarters and looking where you want the horse to go because um, subconsciously, I guess we're actually changing our body position um, to get the horse straight if you actually focus on where you want them to go. If your horse still um, backs up crooked, then you can either use a fence or a wall um, to help to keep them straight and also have a dressage whip uh, just to use on the hind quarter, generally just to guide the horse to where you want them to go. As I say, we're aiming just for a few steps initially. And this is something I'd probably recommend that you do a few times a week. Um, so go back a few steps, and then move forwards a few steps, and then you can back up a few steps, go forwards a few steps. So do a few repetitions of that each time. And you can also look at how the horse steps back. So, you know, does the horse actually lift up, flex its hock and place its foot? Does it just scrape the foot back through the dirt or the sand? Um, does it sort of um, bring its leg out um, rather than lifting the hock up, kind of keeps the leg straight, but just brings it out and, and back. So obviously what we want is for the horse's legs to be moving straight back and for them to actually be flexing through the hock and then placing the foot down. If they're dragging the toe or dragging the foot back, then they're not able to flex through the hock or the stifle, one of those. Um, and likewise, if they're sort of circling it out, then there's some restriction somewhere um, higher up in the leg that's preventing them from um, flexing. So, that was just a few really basic exercises that you can do either ridden or in hand. And I've just got, I've just got one stretch for you to do, but I want to talk about a few other things first of all. So professional care is really important. And I recommend that horse owners get their, their horses seen by a therapist and you know, whatever your preference is, whether that's um, you know, a physio, an osteo, a, 
massage, um, Cairo, whatever it is. I recommend usually somewhere between eight and 12 weeks for most horses that have been worked. Um, if they're working at a higher level or doing a lot of competition, then that might be more frequent. Um, and that's really important because you know, your body worker will be able to pick up on subtle changes in the horse and give you some exercises to do and help to, um, I guess, make sure that the horse's body is in good condition so that it is able to work. Because what often happens is the, the horse is very good at hiding whatever's going on inside it. So it can be in pain, but it often doesn't show us that until it's getting to the point where it is unbearable for them. So by getting your horse seen regularly by your professional therapist, you can make, you know, they have different techniques and look for very subtle indications from your horse that there's something going on and they can make sure they can pick up on things when they are at that subtle stage before it gets to the point of your horse bucking or you know not doing your flying change or whatever it is um, that happens something that i think is highly underrated and you know, i think that's due to lack of time for a lot of people is grooming um, Grooming is really good for the horse and uh, I remember again back when I was first training I did a whole assessment on grooming a horse and using um, what they call it strapping and quartering and you know you have your big massage pad that you're you know thudding on the horse um, on their neck and across the back and the hind quarters to stimulate the blood and you know help the muscles and so actually grooming is often something that I get my clients to do and I get them to focus on certain areas of the horse. Um, and you know, whether that's, you know, just a general brush, um, I often get them to either use their hand to do a bit more massage while they're grooming, um, or, you know, a massage ball or something like that. But, just really getting in there and a good thorough groom for your horse is really good for stimulating the blood flow and you know helping your, your horse's muscles to recover from any soreness that they might be experiencing. Um, dynamic and static stretches so, so we have got um, I have got some carrot stretches that I'll go through with you in a little while but um, the difference between your dynamic and your static stretches are essentially how, how you do that stretch. So your dynamic stretch is something that you would incorporate into like your warm up, for example. So you're getting the horse to increase the amount of flexion through the neck, or you might get them to stretch down and then up. You might start to ask them to do just a small amount of a leg yield or you know some transitions and things like that. So it's kind of asking them to do a mini version of what you're going to be doing in your session. So it's helping the horse to warm up by using the movements that you're going to be using later on. And yeah, if you watch, um, things like cricket or football, when you see them coming onto the pitch and doing their warm up, they you know do kicks without kicking the ball, and they might you know do some throws and things like that. So they're all dynamic stretches. Your static stretch is where you are going to be holding the horse into a position for usually around thirty seconds for your static stretch. So, for example stretching the horse's leg out in front of them is a static stretch. So you're pulling the horse's leg and the horse is an, allowing you to take that stretch and then you hold it in that position and then you release it. With your static stretch, it is really important that the horse is warm. So the horse's body is warm for these. So usually I'd recommend that you do them either after exercise you could do it if, if you've had a really good grooming session, then that will have warmed the, the muscles up a bit. Or we'll take the horse for a bit of a walk. 
before you do any static stretches. Um, your range of motion. So some of these stretches that we do are all about increasing the range of motion. And I just want to mention that you know, it's really important that you look at what the horse is able to do. So I know when I first put this top, when this first topic first went up, I got asked about older horses and you know, the previous exercises that I have discussed are suitable for all horses. For something like the carrot stretch that I'm gonna show you in a minute, your older horse may not be able to stretch that far. Um, you know, when you're stretching the front leg out in front, the older horse may struggle with that a little bit. So it's important to recognize what the horse's normal range of mo motion is. And obviously all of these exercises that we're doing are aimed at increasing the range of motion, but we don't want to force the horse past that. Um, you know, I, I used to do a bit of gymnastics, you know, we used to do the splits and then have somebody sit on our back to make us go further into the splits. Um, I think that sort of thing is probably frowned upon now, uh, especially for your horse. So, you know, we're sticking within the horse's normal range of motion and then just gradually asking them to increase that. Christine, yeah. just before you go on to the last one, yeah. um, in reference to the grooming, um, mm. we've got a question here whether or not you believe that horses can be ticklish. Um, what would you say uh, about a horse that bites and protests with grooming? Yeah, so definitely horses can be ticklish. Yeah, the horse's skin is really sensitive. Yeah, they can feel a fly on them. They can you know, definitely feel us grooming them and doing that sort of stuff. What I tend to find um, with horses that I massage is that I get told that they're very ticklish and they actually much prefer a firmer touch. Um, so I would say try some different things with your horse. Um, so obviously always having to be careful of what is going on with your horse. Don't put yourself into a position where you might get bitten or might get kicked. But try being a little bit firmer or try being a little bit softer and see what response you get from the horse. Um, depending on where they are reacting and again it's very difficult to give a full answer without seeing an individual horse because obviously things like ulcers can cause the horse to be very touchy um, and so you know what an owner I guess might be thinking is the horse being ticklish could actually be them saying actually do you know what my stomach is sore please don't touch me there or it could be them being ticklish so I think you have to bear in mind that it could be one or the other um, so I would start off by trying um, trying different amounts of pressure, try different brushes, try using your hand. Um, I know some horses, it doesn't help for as far as grooming goes, but it would just give you an idea of whether you know, it's ticklish or whether something is sore. Just resting your hand on that area um, and then you, know, you can sort of do a bit of a, a stroke so a very light um, bit of massage and then increase the pressure with that. Hopefully that answers that question. Um, so I just popped at the end here, magnesium and joint supplements on, obviously it's not a stretch or a massage technique, but I think it is something that is really important that we consider how we can support the horse. Um, you know, ultimately, they, they weren't designed to be ridden. So everything that we do does have an impact on their body. And so the more we can do to support them, the better that will be and the longer they can keep um, being ridden. So I quite often recommend either magnesium or joint supplements or both um, to horses, depending on what I see. Um, there's a whole range of different supplements and things out there. I find that some owners report really good results with one supplement over another. I might have a completely different response from another horse. Um, so it's really whatever works best for, for that particular horse. So I tend not to recommend certain supplements. Um, I work with the owner as to what type of supplement they want to, to give, what they're already giving. Um, and what responses they get from 
the horse? I think you've just answered the question that's um, being posted. Um, one of um, Alison's actually asked, what do you think about foresight? Yep. So again, I, I, I've, I've had some clients who use foresight and absolutely rave about it. I've had others that haven't really seen much of a, a difference. I personally haven't used it, so I can't give my personal opinion. But as I said, I really think every horse responds differently to it. And so I tend not to go with, this is the one that you must use. Um, yeah, I think it's always a, a try and see what response you get. Okay, so carrot stretches. So the reason I put carrot stretches in here is that they're a very common exercise that people do, but I see a lot of people doing them incorrectly. So I just wanted to talk through how to actually do them correctly to benefit your horse. So <laughs> we've got lots of different arrows and spots on this horse, so we will talk through them. So as I said before, you know, for these, I'll be talking about where ideally we would want the horse to be coming round to. But if your horse can't get that far, then don't force it. What's most important is the horse's posture during these. So if the horse is moving um, to, to get the carrot, then it's actually not stretching. Um, or if it's you know standing with its legs all splayed out in different directions, again, it's not going to have the same effect. So the first one is round sort of to the, the shoulder area. So we're really just sort of on the, pretty much on the triceps there. Um, so asking the horse to come round to this area. So that's quite a lot of stretch, really just through the neck. Okay, and so once you've done that one, you can then also go down to the horse's um, fetlock and ask the horse to come around to the outside of the fetlock. You can then go to the flank area. So this, the ones at the hindquarters are where most horses start to find them a little bit harder to do. So um, you can you can hold on to the tail and just give a gentle pull on the tail as you're bringing the horse's head round. That sometimes prevents them from just turning around, especially if you've just got a really greedy horse who will just spin around in circles to get the carrot because that's all they want. Um, alternatively, you can sort of put them against a wall to, to help them to, re to prevent doing that. Um, but we do need to consider, I guess, why the horse is spinning around. Is it just that they're greedy and they want the carrot or is it that they find this really difficult and so they can't hold that stretch um, so I say we ideally want them to sort of come around to the flank area and we're wanting them to stay as square as possible with their feet and not move so we're, they're just actually bending around with their neck rather than um, sort of rotating and moving legs this is one that a lot of horses do find really tricky if they're quite stiff. So you might only get sort of halfway along the, the stomach and that's absolutely fine. Just do that and then um, you can hopefully gradually increase how far they can get around um, over time. Now these stretches are baited stretches. So they're kind of, they're kind of a, a static stretch in that we're holding it. Um, but obviously we're, we're using the carrot as the bait to get the horse to hold that stretch themselves. So it is important for these to try not to let the horse just bite the carrot and then go straight again because they haven't actually held that stretch for any length of time. So you almost kind of want to tease them a little bit with the carrot first and then give it to them sort of towards the end of the time of holding that stretch. And for this, yeah, we want to hold them if possible. Um, you know, ideally we'd be holding them for around 20 seconds. Um, a lot of horses don't quite manage it for that long because they're just, you know, they get very impatient and want the carrots. Um, very similar one um, going down to the horse's hock and then down to the back fetlock. Um, so they just have different um, effects on how much spinal flexion there is so the lower the stretch is 
the more lift there's going to be through the back, so the more the spine is going to go into flexion. Um, and then if we look at the blue arrows, I've got one, so bringing the, the carrot between the horse's legs and encouraging the horse to come down and bring its leg, bring its head between its front legs. So between its knees, first of all, and then same thing, but a bit lower down by the fetlock. Um, you do see a lot of um, exercises where they encourage you to sort of bring the horse's um, chin to its chest area. It's not one that I tend to recommend very often because it really sort of compresses the horse's spine um, through the neck, so the, the cervical vertebrae. Um, and yeah, it's important to remember that the horse's spine sort of runs down here. So it's not at the, the top of the, the neck, as a lot of people think. And it's kind of in a bit of an S shape. Um, so this part here, especially where we sort of go into that curve, can get really compressed. And so you know, horses that um, work very much behind the vertical, so you know, they've almost got their chin on their chest there, really compresses that area. And likewise, this exercise can do that if it's done incorrectly. Um, and then the last carrot stretch that I've got there is going to be one to put your horse into extension through the spine. So we're getting the horse to stretch up and out as far as you can. For this one, I often find that it's good to do over a fence or over a, a stable door or something because it actually then prevents the horse from just stepping forward to get the carrot because they've got that barrier there. They actually then have to stretch out and flex through their neck and their, um, and their back. Dean, how high would you recommend um, that going? Obviously, some of us are a lot shorter than our horses. <laughs> yes. Look, you know, it depends on how long you're holding it for and how often you're doing it. I would recommend varying the height. <clears throat> if you watch horses in the wild or even in your paddock, if you've got a tree that they like, um, I think our mulberry tree is pretty dead now, but the horses used to love eating leaves off it. Um, and they stretch really high. Um, and all of these are just about getting the horse to be in different positions. So you know, obviously you wouldn't want to be having your horse's head up super high for you know 10 minutes or something, but for 20 seconds, go as high as you can, see how high your horse can go. Um, and then you know, the next time you might do it a bit, a bit lower. So you're constantly varying that. Um, and you know, while we're talking about that, something else I often recommend is varying the height at which they get fed. So especially if you feed out of a hay net, you know, sometimes feed them hay on the ground, sometimes in the hay net, put the hay net um, in a tree and have it swinging around so the horse actually has to work a bit harder to get it, have it up a bit higher so the horse goes up a bit higher and then comes down again. Um, and you know, what I love is having lots of hay nets with small amounts of hay but having them at different heights out in the paddock so that the horse isn't constantly in the same position um, and something that I heard a while back was and I think it was a human massage therapist or something um, and they said something along the lines of it's not there's no such thing as bad posture it's how long you stay in that posture for and I think that's very true you know if you're constantly in the same position then you know and that's why people that sit at desks a lot of the time get bad backs because we're in that position for a prolonged period of time same for a horse if they're spending five or six hours a day eating hay at the same height then they, they're in that same posture all the time if we can encourage them to move around um, and use their bodies a bit more like they would you know, if they were in the wild, they would eat taller grasses, shorter grasses, bushes, trees, and all sorts of things. Um, so, you know, a lot of these stretches, I think, really are just encouraging different movement and 
putting the horse into lots of different postures um, to improve their overall use of their body. Um, so to summarize, um, now I probably didn't really go into this in as much detail as I possibly could have, but you know, if your horse is recovering from an injury, then please make sure you get vet or therapist um, input. You know, um, that's really important. Type of work and surface variety is the key. So, you know, that's where things like cross training are, are really good as well. I've given you a few different stretches, massage techniques um, and riding techniques um, to, to use. Now, I haven't gone too much into the massage techniques, but um, you know, I talked about them briefly with grooming and said grooming, I think, is something that you know, would be really beneficial if we all spent a bit more time doing that. And I know I'm just as guilty as everybody else of being very time poor and the horse gets a quick flick over and then gets ridden and then gets washed off afterwards. Um, and yeah, that's the beauty of living in Australia where you can do that. Growing up in England, we couldn't. <laughs> so I spent a lot more time grooming horses in England because in winter, when the horse is really muddy or sweaty, you know, you can't just wash them off unless you're lucky enough to have, you know, a nice heated, um, you know, heated water in a lot of stables. You don't have that. Rest days are really important for your horse. Um, and slower is better than faster. And, you know, we can look at that in terms of speed of the pace. Um, so, you know, I talked about slowing things down. Um, but also think about that in terms of what you're expecting from your horse. You know, it's far better to increase things really slowly and avoid those injuries than it is to sort of push the horse faster to do different exercises or increase the amount of work or intensity that of the work um, and you know, getting things like the you know, repetitive strain injury um, and muscular soreness. So just to finish off, I do have um, a course coming up and it's going to be starting in about two weeks. Um, so it's Massage for Horse Owners. So it's online, it's hosted on Facebook. And within that, I will teach you how to check your horse for signs of muscular soreness and some basic massage techniques that you can do. So essentially we cover a, a whole body massage and then some different exercises. So as well as some of the exercises that we've talked about today, there's some different exercises that I will give you it's a four week course and I'm offering that to you guys at half price. So it'd usually be $79. Um, and so I'm offering that at $39.50 um, for you guys, if you would like to participate in that. And so, yeah, I think um, there's my contact details. If, um, if any of you would like to look me up on Facebook or Instagram. I do have a free group which I put some different body work and biomechanics um, information in. Um, I'm based in Brisbane so if any of you are local and would like me to come out and look at your horse then please you know, get in touch but I know there's a lot of people from all over the world. Um, I think I saw somebody from Beckles very close to where I grew up so um, yeah, fellow Suffolk person, hello. Um, obviously, yeah, I can't come and see your horse, but please, yeah, check out my Facebook page, and yeah, I put lots of different information up in all of those places. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, I absolutely, as you know, I absolutely love um, Christine's work. I trust her completely uh, with my horses. She's done some amazing work helping me with custard, and she's also started helping me working. Um, with my new boy Stormy. Um, so I actively encourage you guys, if you're really interested in learning more about massage and things that you can do at home um, in between your own body workers um, sessions, then jump on, um, have a look. I have popped in the um, uh, link to learn more about that particular um, session into the Facebook live group and it will be sent out with the recording 
um, as well. So you'll have access to that. Um, it kicks off on May 18th and the half price offer is available until then. So do sign up if you do have that chance and you're really keen. Um, so this actually summarizes or ends our session for um, this evening with Christine. So thank you guys very much for hopping on and the great questions that you have been asking. Um, we will be back in about an hour and a half at 7.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Times for our very final session in the summit, which is me and I'm starting to get my little tingly nerves now, so <laughs> getting excited. Um, but so far it has been absolutely great. Thank you guys so much for participating. Thank you, Christine, for your presentation. It has been super inf informative and we will catch you guys again live soon. Bye. Thanks, bye.